Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I meet a abstract mixed media artist named Susan Hensel. Susan is someone who has their own gallery, but the gallery is something that's very unique. Uh, we find out more about that later on in the episode, but uh, I really like the way that the gallery kind of turned out. It's kind of a surprise, so that was cool. Um, the way Susan started out was not started out, but started out in the sort of media style that Susan uses now began with embroidery and an automated machine creating a Donald Duck sewing portrait. I don't know the right way to say it as far as how sewing goes, but that's intriguing, right? <laughs> it's a it's a great story on how it went from that because of just seeing something to exploring and finding a grant to actually reproduce an idea that came from it. It's a it's a fantastic uh, story. And we also talk a bit about how uh, Susan actually used one of the uh, ideas that I talked about on a recent podcast for creating lead ads to collect information or to collect emails to send out information about her artwork. If you listen to, to my, uh, my Facebook ad podcast, that's the one where I talk about creating a lead ad and we kind of delve into more of how the lead ads can export. That made sense, right? I think so. Anyway, you'll hear about all this, so I don't need to explain it now. So here's my interview with Susan Hensel starting right now. This is Susan Hensel. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I am a textile artist who paradoxically works in three, dimension, three dimensions with very little in the way of armatures. Okay. I work with computers and cool thread and mixed media as needed. Is cool thread a specific thing or are you just saying cool like it's really cool thread or is there actually a label of cool thread that I'm unaware of? Oh, I wish it were called that. It's embroidery thread. I work okay. in digital embroidery. Digital this, embroidery. Yeah. Yeah. Digital embroidery is basically the stuff that um, you put on baseball caps and letter jackets. It's that kind of stuff. It's developed for the clothing and monogram kind of market. Yeah. Um, but those same tools and software can be applied to fine art. Explain how uh, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of what you said or yeah, what you said, bears, right? Yeah, bears exactly. And- yeah, and, yeah, the, and uh, print on demand has been offering that now, and it's like there are specific. I know there's specific software you have you have to have to go like, okay, I want to submit this drawing I did as an embroidery, and it confuses me. Yeah. But you're saying it can be used for fine art, so elaborate on that, please. I'm curious. Oh, I certainly will. Uh, let me tell you a little story about right. how this happened. Um, I've been an artist almost as long as I can remember, and my uh, art training was in painting, which I'm a lousy painter. I can mix colors, but that's about it. And sculpture. So those are my two majors. Okay. And so I have the the brain of a sculptor, which means that I love materials. I love space. And tools and materials just excite me tremendously. Mm-hmm. And, and one year, actually not too long after I moved here, I moved to Minneapolis from uh, the middle of Michigan about 20 years ago. So I've, I've become a Midwesterner par excellence. Yeah. And I went to the Minnesota State Fair. Now, I've never seen a state fair like this. I don't know the size of Wisconsin State Fair. It's pretty big. <laughs> it's pretty big. Well, you know, Minnesota's state fair is the size of the city I grew up in. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's huge. Yeah. And, and one year, um, I don't go every year, but I do go because I had to find out what all the hoopla was about, (laughs) you know. And I went to the demonstration building where manufacturers and stores are showing their wares. So it's it's a lot of things of, you know, buy our cool knives, buy our vacuum food storage system, you know, it's that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I rounded a corner, and there was a machine stitching out a Donald Duck. 
with a bright blue jacket. Okay. Now, I didn't, and nobody was touching the machine. It was just doing it. And it looked like a sewing machine with an embroidery hoop on it, which is, you know, what it was. And I didn't care that it was hands-free, and I didn't care that it was Donald Duck. Not at all. But what I cared was that blue was the most amazing blue I've ever seen in my life. All right. It was the most ultra, ultramarine blue of anything I have ever seen. And I had to have it. Huh. It was like it was like an epiphany. It was like stopping me in my tracks kind of experience. Um, I described it to somebody the other day that it's kind of like when you've met your life partner and it's either you go, yeah, I know it's my life partner, or you say, ooh, that was different. Okay. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It was, yeah, it's kind of one of those moments where you kind of know something shifted. And so I I worked hard to get a grant to get the machine. Well, that didn't happen. So I got a loan. Okay. Yeah, they have have generous loans so that you, if you pay every month for five years, you don't pay interest. So that's cool. How would would you apply for a loan to do that? Like, was you just go, hey, I need a loan for an embroidery machine? Yeah, they mostly, they mostly offer them. It's really pretty wonderful. Because the machines are terribly expensive. Okay. The whole the little one needle home machines are pretty horrible at, I don't know, three thousand or so, and they go up from there. And so I started with the one needle. Okay. Obviously. Um, I didn't know there was anything else, truthfully. <laughs> right. I, I had no idea what I was getting I don't expect into. you to be an expert on it right away. Of course not. <laughs> no. I mean I ne- I I don't even own anything with a teddy bear, you know, stitched on it. <laughs> okay. You know? I didn't know what I was getting into. I just needed to have that blue. And I yeah. instantly saw that there was something there I needed to work with technically. Because if I could work with that kind of color um, on different kinds of materials, I knew something was going to happen. I didn't know what. Yeah. But I knew I had to do it. And so I didn't get the grants for the machine, but I did get a grant for the very first piece of digitizing software that was made for the Macintosh, because I'm a Mac girl from the Mm get-go. And it was horrible software and using it on a horrible machine with horrible training, because all the training that they offer you, they offer you free training. It's all about putting that teddy bear in the right place on the sweatshirt. Okay. And I'm assuming this was before YouTube, where you could have just looked up 10 million videos on how to use it. Yeah. Right. No, even on YouTube, it's all about how to put the teddy bear right there on your shirt. All right. Yeah. Most of the YouTube videos don't tell you anything about how that teddy bear was designed. Hmm. All right. And this was about eight or 10 years ago. Wow. And there probably are more now. So I fulfilled the grant, truthfully, by the skin of my teeth through ordering books from all over the world and taking courses on Craftsy and and really pinning down the instructor saying, yeah, but what's that mean? Right. How do I control that? What were the, uh, what were the, the uh, I'm, I'm sorry to go back, but what were the okay. stipulations of the grant that you had to fulfill? I had to come up with a, a project that was presented in a gallery. Okay. And so the project that I presented was called Wearing My Age. And it was a textile project where I would interview through a survey people from all over the United States, specifically women, about what they wear to work at different ages and what and what the um, what their uniforms meant. What did they think they they said about them? And it was really interesting. And I took what they said. And it was going to be embroidered directly on clothing I designed, except that I couldn't figure out how to do it. Right, yeah. So, so I wound up embroidering um, what they told me on twill tape that I found online, mm-hmm. because it's very sturdy. And, and I wrote all these things. Like, when I wear my apron, I feel like I can conquer the world when I walk into the studio. Oh. But the moment I take the apron off, I feel like a stupid head, you know? <laughs> and then there are the other people who, who, when they put on their aprons, you know, working in a cafeteria, suddenly they're stupid people to the people they're serving. But they have PhDs and they just haven't gotten the good job yet. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, you know, some of those kinds of things. Okay. Or I'm the smartest person in the room who's never been listened to. Hmm. Oh, that's a good one. I like that one. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. And so there were layers to these uniforms that I developed. Um, There was the public layer, the slightly more personal layer, kind of the stuff you'd talk to the people in the office about. And then underneath it was a petticoat, which was the secret stuff. Mm, okay. So, so that was what the women who told me I always wear sexy underwear, no matter what, huh. you know, even though I'm wearing scrubs, that, that kind of stuff. So interesting. Yeah. So it was fascinating. You know, I got hundreds of replies, hundreds, and then developed it into the show that I got done about a day before it was due. Okay. That's barely. <laughs> and this was all, so it was all trial and error and you making these things while learning the, work. Th- okay. Yeah. That's nice. Making it work. How did you so find the people as, to survey? To survey? Um, I think I just used SurveyMonkey, and I have a robust mailing list. Okay. All and right. I also um, had various forums that I knew I could post to that I've gotten information from before. Gotcha. Uh, because I've used surveys as a way of collecting ideas before, yeah. not just data, but actionable data for artwork. It's kind of fun, really. Okay. You know, there, there was one I did um, where I developed a script and then I I encouraged a couple of friends who have a little bit of a drama background to play the parts. And we we um, we recorded them. That's probably why I have the microphone okay. that I forgot I had. <laughs> and um, and that was the background um for a video installation i did that my son helped me pull off all right so yeah yeah he's uh he's a whiz and i had developed a very large screen uh like 12 feet long eight feet high of self-portraits all because i had a pair of glasses i wasn't sure i liked (laughs) so i thought i'd just start you know, I just start drawing my face. Is it weird I that I know, ex- like, I kind of like know exactly what you mean by saying yeah. that? That's really funny. Uh, yeah, just, and I, did I, it for I wasn't like a sure. Year. So I did this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I did it for like a year. Okay. And we turned all these little six by six drawings into a humongous screen. And we set up a video camera um, through it. And when people came in the room, they were videotaped coming in and then projected back on to the screen twice. And they wound up interacting with their own images All right. as they were looking at the images of me being querulous about my new glasses. <laughs> nice. I like yeah, that. And, and, and so the soundtrack was going. But anyways, we did digress, did we not? I was just going to say, so we moved from embroidery to uh, to video installations. but And I, I actually did want to go back. And first of all, did you ever find that blue uh, string? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Explain to me how you finally came across that, Uh, because I'm intrigued. Yeah, well, let me tell you about embroidery thread and what I discovered about it. You know, right after I I finished the grant, I did have to go invest in a a PC and better software. And so I did get more comfortable with the PC environment. And the PC native softwares actually are much more stable and more flexible. And the software is, it's drawing software. You know, um, but it combines aspects of um, Photoshop and Illustrator both. Yeah. Which I found really confusing until I got the hang of it. Right. Basically, you're working in layers and you're working in shapes and you're filling them with stitches. Was it fireworks? No, no. It's actually the one that I use the most is Hatch Embroidery. I mean, it's specific to embroidery. Okay, it is. And there are others made by Wilcom. Um, and a few others. Uh, there's a Swedish one I use when I want to make lace objects. Oh, and nice. yeah, it's really cool. Actually. Okay. <laughs> um, but what I discovered um, over a couple of the early years of working with this embroidery, I mean, it's great pictorially. It's great to make pictures, right? Okay. Um, no, no problem with that. You just have to figure out how thick to make things so that the fabric doesn't pucker so much you can't see it all right all right right but one summer um, when i was up on the north shore getting cool in the middle of the summer when it's too hot in (laughs) minneapolis for me (laughs) for those that don't know from the beginning of this conversation we talked about our differences in the weather and how i love the summer (laughs) 
(laughs) And it's cold out right now and she likes that. (laughs) Yes, I love the cold. Uh, So I love going up to the North Shore and getting cold in the middle of summer. Okay. And I I take a single needle embroidery machine with me and materials and I just play and figure things out. And one summer um, I figured out that if I worked with making gradients, which makes some sense, Mm -hmm. I would have some interesting color. Well, yes, of course you would. But what I discovered was that as I moved this fabric around, just looking at it, the color shifted. Hmm. And I figured out that I could make folds that were permanent. And so I suddenly started making three-dimensional objects. But this color was shifting remarkably. So I decided I better study the thread. And I started studying the thread. The standard embroidery thread is called trilobal polyester thread. It's extruded. It's just polyester, but there are three basic strands of it. And what that means is that the cross section is more or less triangular, like a prism. Okay. Now, some of the some of the light might go through, but the main thing is you've got three sides that light is bouncing off of. And the bounce of the light is what gives you your color. And the angle of that bounce shifts the color. So if I just had nothing but that ultramarine blue thread, it would be going, I'm really ultramarine blue. And then I'm a little bit green ultramarine blue. Then, oh my goodness, I am such an ultramarine blue huh. when, I, when I bounce in this direction. So the, the thread sparkles and shifts in a way that ordinary cotton thread doesn't Hmm. because cotton can't reflect in that way and when you begin to combine different colors of threads together and you let what you've stitched on show through you have just the most astonishing rainbow effect that you can imagine it's almost like one of those billboards that they don't make as much anymore they're all digital now but they do the same thing you walk by in one direction it looks like one thing Uh and if you reverse direction it looks like another right yeah those were the lenticular lenses i don't even know oh i didn't know what they were called that's i don't know why i know (laughs) except i grew up among um engineers so things stick from your childhood gotcha all right yeah and and it's almost like that Hmm. And I rarely use more than maybe two or three colors and then the color that I'm stitching on. But the effect is as though I've got a full rainbow. Wow. It's really remarkable. Huh. So that's why I stay with it. Holy Toledo. It just, you know, floored me. Yeah. uh, What could happen with it. And I kind of found it by accident and then exploited it. Yeah. And at this point, were you already doing uh, the abstract work that you do now and this kind of got incorporated into it? Like, how did that start? Um, This is what came out of it. Okay, Um, I've been through many, um, many phases in my art life. I started out as a potter, but my pottery became very abstract, very decorative. I worked in um, porcelain and and I actually did, you know, some of the top art fairs in the Midwest. That's that's where I started out. Mm-hmm. Um, but funny thing, you know, paper started showing up with the pots somehow. And and pretty soon I was making paper because why not? <laughs> and then and then I finished doing what I needed to do with clay because clay was no longer the correct medium for what I wanted to express. Huh. And I had, had reached a phase where I needed to get a little bit more specific about where I wanted people's experience to be. Um, My work has always been about providing an experience for the viewer, the owner, the whoever, and to change their lives in some way. So when I worked in pottery, it was about helping people slow down and be more present in their daily lives to make those things we just gotta do every day that gets pretty tiresome sometimes a little more special Mm -hmm. so that they could just take a deep breath and either look at their own plate if they're alone or look across the table go wow okay Mm -hmm. we had a day (laughs) and wow 
those greens look great on that plate. I mean, you know, it's to have those experiences where you can pay attention to something besides your own anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the the next phase was artist books. And that's actually where I probably made most of my reputation up till now. Artist books in what manner? Um, I I developed and made from scratch art um books that that provided again an experience because you have to open and close books, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's some narration, but not a complete story. And so when things really work, this is a sculpture you hold in your hands and you manipulate and it guides you to a possible conclusion of whatever the visuals and little bits of text are telling you and even the shape mm-hmm. and the form of the book so that you are changed by by providing the ending to the story yourself. Okay. I mean, there's one I made um, called um, Give Me the Words. And it was based on, it was entirely textbook, but but it doesn't look like a book entirely. Uh, I had a friend who used to call me with all of the problems of the world. Um, and and As at we the all end do. of it, um, <laughs> yeah, I know, you know, you know, we women, we get on the phone, we solve the problems of the world. And yeah. at the end of any conversation, she go, what was that? You said, give me the words. Oh, so it was an actual phrase. All that? right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would go, um, 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 I don't know exactly. Maybe it was X, Y, and Z. And so this is kind of the story. And the story really was that, you know, we I've been through the bog before and I made it to the other side. You can too. And, and then at the very end of the book, there are the whole text of the book is on movable magnets and any way that you put it together right. could be good or it could be bad. Yeah. So you get to complete the story for yourself. It's that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, and it's in collecting libraries all over the United States. So oh. when did you yeah. put this out? Um, this would have been, boy, that's a hard question. It's numbers, Tom. Numbers are not my best thing. <laughs> Words you're fine um, with. It's the numbers they throw you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did pretty well with text as long as you don't see my typing. Okay. Um, I would say that was in the eighties and nineties. All right. All right. So, cause the reason I ask is because I was like, were you self-publishing? Were you running through someone? Um, no, it's self-publishing. It's, it's kind of an offshoot of printmaking in a way because the editions were only well they were they were maybe 10 maybe 20 sometimes yeah. i only had enough materials because it was found material sometimes to make five okay but the advantage being because it's a limited edition you can then not only sell it multiple times but you can exhibit at the same time in different places right but it was nothing so that was a- done through like uh, amazon or lulu or no, anything like no. that okay that's why i was asking because no, i was like didn't exist yet right that's yeah that's why i wanted to know around the time that you did yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i've never had to go through actually publishing a physical book on my own like how did you how did yeah. you round that up uh, and from what you said it didn't look like a normal textbook so how did no, you no no it doesn't um i chose Sometimes I made the paper, but I figured that made the books too expensive. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just <laughs> tremendously expensive. And um, and it also wasn't always the right thing. Um, I just used really good kind of cardstock stuff. I There were certain ones that I really liked, and I ran them through, depending on what I was doing. You know, I ran them through a laser printer um, or a pigment printer, and sometimes I worked back into them. Okay. Um there i used oh there was this one handmade paper i used for a book i think i'll never sell i'll bequeath it to my son when i die um it's on the most beautiful handmade paper i think i've ever seen in my life but the reds wouldn't print okay and so i had to this was pretty early before golden had all kinds of um, mediums to put on but i found a medium i could put on that would allow the reds to print like red Mm -hmm. instead of brown Okay. And without changing what the paper looked like. So, you know, just rich color and um, poetry and whatever was needed. So, yeah, just it's beautiful stuff. I've been working on a couple this week and, and realizing how much I've forgotten how to bind. Yeah. 
<laughs> totally screwed up one of the covers. <laughs> so I'm making it over again entirely. Okay. So, yeah. But then I, when I moved here, um, which is has a major center for book arts, as you may know. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like the words left the building. Mm-hmm. Um, when I moved from Michigan, people assumed I was moving here for the book arts. Um, but I moved here because the arts in a general sort of way um, are understood in this community as being important. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean people participate any more than they do anywhere else, but they would be horrified if the museum shut down. They would be horrified if money was taken away from the orchestra in the middle of a season, both of which happened to us in Michigan. Yeah. And, and they would, you know, they would take it to the mat. And in fact, they did. It's in the constitution now of Minnesota that X amount of money has to go to the arts and, um, and, and wildlife and one other, you know, thing. And, and I wanted that quality of life. And so when I moved here, I opened a gallery, partly because I've done gallery work for a long time. It also was a great way to meet people because I only knew two people in town when I moved here. Yeah. That was yeah. actually what I was going to ask because you move there and it's one thing to go, I'm moving there for the art scene, but then it's like, well, then how do you get into the art scene when you move into a new place? So, and I want to work up to the gallery too, because I have some questions about that, but let's, okay. So yeah. you moved into, you, you go to the state fair, you move into the place and like, how did you get? started like how did you start to uh get involved in the art community when you when you first started out or moved over there well the first thing i did was um there are two things i did probably at the same time one was i volunteered at a nonprofit that i liked very much it's it's defunct now unfortunately but it was hmm. a phenomenal place the soap factory um, they put on um, international shows of experimental artwork, and I loved their program. I had visited them when I had visited before. Okay. And so I volunteered there, and through them, um, I got alerted to a small press um, conference so that I could meet the editors and find out about all the newspapers around town and what they do and what they need. And I also happened on around the same time um, a small conference on using um, email for marketing. Ah, Now people were just starting this stuff, right? This was in 2004, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I was opening a gallery in my downstairs space. I bought this building. You saw the beautiful tin ceiling when I I did. (laughs) I I put the phone down. Um, The building's over a hundred years old and, um, the front part of the downstairs was both my studio and my gallery, which was hard on studio work. But um, I had a, a program that was national of art that had narrative and or political content for the better part of nine years. And I would have new shows every two months and they varied between solo shows and group shows. I had probably three good-sized group shows a year, but they're kind of a nightmare to administrate. It's much easier to administrate, you know, a one-person show. But with with all of the addresses and the contacts that I got through um, volunteering at the Soap Factory and the skills I brought from um, doing marketing in with the Michigan galleries that I worked with, I got seen immediately. Partly because I don't think anybody else was using social media at the time. I was already on Facebook mm-hmm. and and I had a robust email list. At that time, I'm going to use the word only because I'm shocked at how big the list is now. It was only 3,000 oh, when I moved here. Poor thing. Only. <laughs> yeah, that's close to 8,000 now. Right. And and most of it I've just collected, you know, or done the research for. I think there's only like 300 or 400 that I actually purchased. I purchased a small list. How are you getting signups for it? Uh, there are different methods to get people to sign up uh, yeah, that go beyond yeah. just like um, sign up for my list. You know, are there? Yeah, well, with a gallery, you put out the gallery book. Okay. Right. And um, 
And I always ask my artists to please share their emails. They aren't required to. Okay. But please, because that will help all of us. And most of them do. Not all do. Yeah. But most do. Right. And even um, if they do, they always have the option to, you know, opt oh, out. Yeah. You know, of like, course. yeah. So it's never of permanent. Course. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. You know, at the other end, they can always go spam. Right. You know. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I'm all too so familiar. Built, <laughs> yes. Yes. You know, so I've built it up that way and just looking like to agencies and organizations, I want to be aware of what I'm doing. And again, you know, I put them in my mail list and they can always go, mm, not really. Right. And some do and some don't, mm-hmm. you know, um, and my my open rate, this is getting really nerdy technical. I was literally um, going to ask you the same thing. <laughs> we're good because I know you're nerdy about this stuff. too. No, and this is a, I, I feel like this is the type of stuff people would like to know, like when you start an email list it feels like nobody's opening it or, you know, yeah. when you send it out, nobody's clicking on anything. And, and it's yeah. funny to go like, no, actually that's not that uncommon. It's, it's pretty yeah. average. Like, so your open rate, oh, yeah. I want to see what was your open rate. You were saying, what, what were oh, your percentages? Well, it depends on what I'm sending out the, but my usual newsletter that I send out sporadically, I'm not on a schedule. It's kind of like, Oh, there's enough stuff. I'll send you a, a good newsletter. Okay. Um, my usual open rate is in, is about 22%, which oh, is that's good. That's very good. It's yeah. very high. Yeah. Yeah. My marketing guys, when they do one for me, they get 12%. Mm-hmm. I do 22. Huh. <laughs> and when I sent to um, my, but of course they're doing a different group too. And they're doing a different kind of thing. Yeah. But um, they're doing a cold call kind of thing. But I did a cold call to my art consultant list which was a new list for me. I mean, uh, there were a couple of of consultants on there I knew and I'd had some business with, but there were a bunch of people I'd never met in my life. Mm -hmm. I got a 41% open rate. Wow. And the click-through was pretty high also. Huh. So I I don't remember the click-throughs well. For me, the click-through rate is the one that I'm still struggling with. Uh, Oh, it's a hard one. Yeah. Yeah, if you get them for a minute on your page, you're Mm -hmm. doing great. Yeah. You're doing great. And just uh, just so people know what we mean through the click-through rate, it's one thing to send the email, but uh, you send a link in the email and the click-through rate is how many people actually clicked on it to go yeah. to the site, just for people that yeah. might not know. And yeah, I would, I mean, mine's usually like, it's it's, it's very low. It, it, I don't yeah. know why. Maybe they already know where to go because I feel like the thing that I'm sending them to still gets viewed enough. I don't know. It's yeah, weird. Yeah. Well, and I do a couple of things with with this. It's not enough just to send the the email newsletter, right? Yeah. Um, I make sure that that posts to Instagram and Facebook. Oh yeah, yeah, because okay. that increases the views. Also, yeah, that doesn't account. Um, that's not part of my you know twenty twenty two percent open rate. That's just the Mailchimp. You know, oh, you are using MailChimp. That. that was going to be my next question. You're so much in my head right now. <laughs> uh, I used to use vertical response, but when I a few years ago, when I hired um, Faceless Marketing to assist me, uh-huh. they're the guys from Florida who I think contacted you. Yes. Um, they suggested I move over to MailChimp because the analytics were better. Um, they just recently response. got better. They weren't better before. <laughs> yeah, well, they're they're pretty darn good. And I've started using the analytics on Facebook more. Although I'd like to pick your brain about some of that too. Sure. Yeah. Where do I where do I pick up my leads? You know, I just put up a lead. Oh, ad. you did one of those lead ads that I talked about. Um, it's in the same place where you created the lead form, or did you create the lead form through the ad itself? Uh, like how did you add itself? I think. Okay. You might've. So what you do is if you go to, if you go into the business section of your page uh, and I'll get more, I'll get more succinct after we're done to show you, but basically there's um, when you go to uh, there's like a thing that's, you know, it shows you all the options for your Facebook book uh, business page. Yeah. And then there's an option that goes uh, show all, Things like yeah. it's going to show you in the the bar like the things it thinks you want to do to manage your page, uh-huh. and then there's an option to show all. You'll see a thing there that says forms, and you click oh, okay. on that, and it'll show you the forms, and then you can actually download the most recent ones that are there. Good. 
but make sure you yeah, don't wait too long I'm because they expire there, but I don't know how to get them. Yeah. They, they <laughs> expire. So don't wait too long. It's like 180 days. So that yeah. way you're not just sitting there collecting a big database. Um, so yeah, when you download them, yeah. And then oddly enough, they're really easy to import into MailChimp. Uh, there yeah. used to, there is a way to automate it, but the, uh, that I used through, um, uh, zap, uh, oh, that's not the full name Zapier. Zapier is an automated tool. Uh, uh-huh. where you used to be able to go the instant that they actually submitted to the form, that form would shoot that email directly over to MailChimp. They still have it, but now it's a paid feature. And the paid feature is like $29 a month. And I'm like, oh, oh. you know, I'm like, now, I can just do it by hand. I have like that simply because the damn thing has worked well for me. And the other one that's still free, I couldn't get to work right. right. You yeah. Know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Doing it by hand is fine. Uh, it's, uh, but I love, I love that. Uh, I love the lead or, uh, ad thing because I don't have to build a landing page. I don't have to send people anywhere. Yes. That's so beautiful. Yes. <laughs> Although yeah, Mailchimp no, does have a I, great when lead. When I read that and listened to it from you, it was like, oh, that is brilliant. Yeah. No, that's I've, a good one. It's so handy. I love it. Well, and I here's what I want to say because I just had this conversation with an artist the other day. Was saying, I don't want to do all this stuff. I just want to make my art. Right. Why is all of this nerdy stuff we're talking about important? Yeah. Because you make your art, you got to get people to see it. Mm-hmm. If they can't see it somewhere, anywhere, they're not going to buy it. I mean, we're not, you know, our, we're not going to have what I always called the Lana Turner story. There's this old story about the old movie star lana turner yeah. supposed, was supposed to be the sexiest woman on earth in the 1940s or something and she was discovered working in the commissary you know at mgm or wherever right it, it this never happens you right. don't get discovered right you have to go show people yeah, it's well, it's the same thing, too, when uh, I've talked about making websites. And this is an example I've actually used with clients because they'll they'll want to design it first before they put it out. And I'll be like, well, we got to put content on it. And they're like, well, can't we see how it looks or, uh, you know, I want it. It needs to be like this and this and we have to have this section and uh, we can't publish it until we have all this perfect. And I'm like, we can publish it right now and work on it. I'm like, if we publish it and everybody finds it, then you have the greatest marketing strategy in the entire world because all people try to do is get people to show up to their stuff. You right. have to, you know, it's like, don't, you know, you have to promote it. People aren't just going to accidentally come across it and suddenly millions of people are going to be exposed no. to something you put out there. It's, no. it's hard. Uh, yeah. It's, it is. Uh, but you know, when, when I, I, I don't teach much anymore. I mostly, I will mentor from time to time. Okay. And the, and, you know, the job of making art isn't just the widget you've made. Mm-hmm. You know, there's more to it. You know, you have to you have to photograph it, inventory it. You may have, in my case, you got to box it because you can't stack them on top of each other. Oh, yeah. And, you know. <laughs> I didn't even think and, of that. Yeah, yeah. You got, and you've got to tell somebody about it. Mm-hmm. Because if the arts, I, I look upon artwork as being functional whether you drink out of it or not it's got work to do in the world right yeah it i mean it it does me great good to make artwork but all of us most of us who are in this business at some point if we persist we got way more artwork than we got relatives and we got to start doing something with it yeah beyond giving it to our relatives and um and it the good work that it does for us makes us feel good, makes us healthy. I mean, I'm I am not a happy person unless I am making things. Oh, I get that. Yeah. Yeah, I know you do. And <laughs> most artists feel the same way. And and some aspect of that um is available to the people who see it and own it. Um and because they're responding at some kind of deep level to it. It may have, they may not have words to it at all. It may just be, no, I, I just have to have that. Mm-hmm. I have to be with that because of how it makes them feel. And the words I give to it, it is very similar to what I said about pottery earlier, which is I want to provide an experience that will provide for even a moment a small rest, 
Like if you can imagine one of my pieces in an office, you're being pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed to do more with less, do more with less, do more with less. And what have you done for the, for the business today? So yeah, you can't afford to take a half an hour off right now, Mm -hmm. but you can look up and go at at a piece of artwork and go, Oh, okay. And, And even that is enough to help you return to the task at hand with renewed vigor with renewed creativity. Um, it's sort of a call for Sabbath in a way, you know, it very few of us can afford a full day off. Let's face it. Right. Um, but if you can manage it, um, you're, if you can manage a Sunday off, your Mondays are so much better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's still Monday, right. You know, <laughs> but, but, um, I find that if I could manage to take the time off, um, if, cause sometimes deadlines hit. Yeah. Um, but if you can manage to take the time off, you come back to work with, with a better attitude and better creativity. Yeah. You know? And, and so when the computer breaks down for the 10th time and you drop your phone on the toilet, <laughs> you get through it. Painting a picture there. <laughs> yeah, I tell you. And, well, you know, I think technology, which I really can't do what I do without, um, also is a slave driver. Okay. Of course it is. And, and I don't think there's anything that makes any of us probably more angry uh, than our technology misbehaving. Right. It's, it's so frustrating. And yeah. one thing I wanted to uh, ask you about too. So your gallery that you have there, tell me about your yeah. gallery. What's, what's the gallery entail? What, what do you got in that place? Okay. Right now, in terms of the actual building, it's just the shop windows. Yes. This is an old building, mm. hundred years, and it's got shop windows. You can stand up in, even if you're over six feet tall. Okay. And they're about three feet deep. So it's the size frankly of a small gallery in new york okay and it's outward so facing the, windows that's what you're saying the gallery is yeah oh that's cool i like yeah, that and it's on a major thoroughfare so it's it used to be a bus stop right out front until very recently but it's um the, <laughs> this is going to sound like an ad and that's it kind of okay. is P- for people who watch um the food channels because there, there are people who do, and I can always tell when they've been watching this segment. I'm with within sight and scent of Matt's Bar, the home of the Juicy Lucy. <laughs> and I can always tell when their segment has come up on the Food Channel. Yeah. Because the line that's there um, on the weekend when they open suddenly is a block long. Okay. So, he could, oh, I mean, Obama went there. Yeah. When he was here. Although I didn't know it. <laughs> you were right there. You missed it. I missed it. You know, my neighbor said, oh, yeah, I bet she's watching it. They oh. were on their third floor. I was down at the street level and the curtains were down on the back, so the back of the windows. I couldn't see out. <laughs> oh, man. That's but, pretty cool, though. Um, yeah, yeah. So the rest of the gallery is on artsy.net now. All right. Um, I shut down the... Um, the in-person in the studio gallery maybe five years ago um i loved 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 every moment of running the gallery but i loved my studio work more ah that makes sense you know and and the balance wasn't working for me anymore Mm -hmm. and so i decided to retire the program i still put things in the windows Mm -hmm. um and i and until i started the the artsy um, presence. It was just local artists. Anybody, it didn't matter. Give them their, you know, their first try. They can list it on their, you know, resume as a solo. Mm-hmm. That's cool. But during the pandemic, um, when the pandemic hit, 100% of my own shows were canceled or delayed. What was delayed like two and a half years. The rest were just canceled. They just went away. Yeah. I had a full schedule lined up for the first year and it was gone. Okay. And, and while I don't rely on the income from that, I do rely on the development of it for my ongoing career and for my estate planning and all of that garbage. And 
it was really um, mind bending. I, I really didn't know what I was supposed to be doing because everything just got thrown on the ground. Even promotion didn't make sense at that point. Yeah. And um, after I got over being frozen in place for a few weeks, like most of us were, um, maybe a month, I don't know. I, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. First thing I did was I started doing um, small online shows of my own work from my website and so that um, it would help people find their way through the ridiculous amount of work I have in, in a systematic way. And so I would promote those as shows. Mm-hmm. And, and then I thought, well, what about Artsy? You know, I've been following Artsy since they opened, I think it's 13 years ago, because they, it's great for looking at art. They've yeah. got good editorial content. I mean, it's really a lovely site. And so I contacted them. I heard nothing. Contacted them again and again. And, and um, they finally got back with me. And the I think of it as rent. You yeah. know, if the monthly rent was within my ability to pay. And so I, so I decided that what it was time for me to give back again. And what I wanted to do was to help other Midwestern artists who have a particular focus on materiality be seen in the larger world. And it's, it's tough. It's tough. And I'm talking with Artsy a lot right now about what they can do for smaller galleries. But we're going into our third year on Artsy, and the sales have been tepid at best. Um, But the eyes on the work has has gone up several hundred percent since the first year. Obviously, since you started zero, it's pretty easy to go up several hundred percent. Very true. Yeah, the math works out there. (laughs) Yeah, the math works really well in the first few years. But, you know, the first show, we had like maybe 60 different people who looked at the artwork. And and now we average um, 135, 140 to start the shows. And our highest show, you know, is something like 600. Okay. So that's a big change in two years yeah so that means that the that part of the marketing is working and we get international um coverage in weird places but you know the the, internet for you (laughs) yeah oh it is it is you know um (laughs) yeah we we're always got covered in bangladesh i don't exactly know why but we do Hmm. all right yeah all right whatever (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> and then I just had one more question to ask you, and that would be about projects that you have coming up, or is there anything you'd like to tell people to keep an eye out for, sure. or things that you have coming sure. up? Sure. Well, I have a show that I developed. There are two things I could tell you. I have a show I developed that I'm traveling right now. Oh. And it, it's it's got two titles to it because I forgot the title. <laughs> um, <clears throat> truth be known. Um, it's, it's going to be finishing up in Hopkins, Minnesota, and it's a large show of 35, 40 pieces. I can't remember the exact count, all sculptural embroidery and mixed media. Okay. And while it's in Hopkins, it's called, um, at play in the fields of color perception. But what I thought the title was, (laughs) and it is for (laughs) the next two venues is bending toward beauty. Those are very different. (laughs) They are. They are. Well, my my um my artist statement, which is more of a position statement for this fl- for the show, has to do with a concept um that's called radical beauty. And I don't know if if I developed it or if I just thought of it in response to something or if it's out there. But the idea is that with radical beauty is that it's 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 something beyond the pretty. Pretty's fine, no problem. Yeah. But if the beauty is serious enough, it will affect a person on the next side, which and will allow them, in a radical way, to do the slowdown mm-hmm. and to maybe begin to imagine the world as they would like it to be. It's kind of tough-minded, actually, just like optimism actually <laughs> is. You have to decide it. You know, you have to decide that it is possible 
to create a world that you want to live in and to be part of the creation of that world. And that's the idea behind the beauty component. And bending, I thought, was kind of about, oh, just kind of leaning into it and the fact that everything is Mm three-dimensional. So it's going to the Duluth Art Institute um, early in December. I can't remember the exact opening date. It's something like the 16th of December. Okay. I have to do a quick turnaround, rent the truck, go to Hopkins, and then drive it up to Duluth. <laughs> and um, and then in May, it's going to the Springfield Art Association in Springfield, Illinois. Oh, cool. And they contacted me and asked me to do it. Oh, nice. So they contacted you. Which is you. nice. Yeah, that's very nice. Very nice. And they're going to bring the truck. Oh, that's you don't even better. have to drive it this time. Okay. I don't. There you go. Moving on up there. All right. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, through some of these other things, and this is just kind of a note for exhibiting artists um, who who work with galleries. And the reason I work with galleries is because the work doesn't belong in art fairs anymore. I mean, whatever. Yeah. Um, The all of this social media promotion I've done and um, saying yes to magazines and wherever um and to people like you Mm -hmm. um has got me a couple of little um international things too so i've got um a show in a shop window Mm -hmm. in leipzig germany at the moment yeah and i'm not exactly sure which path they followed to find me but find me they did Mm -hmm. so that's lovely and and through another um, small, well, it's not a small organization, but it's it's a generally semi-professional organization. It's got both amateurs and professionals. It's called the Textile Study Group of New York, and um, I always participate with them in any online thing, and I'm always almost always in their online shows. But they had an opportunity to take work to Korea, mm. and I said, "You betcha." Yeah. I'll make something like right now. And so then I got the Korea thing. And then it turns out that's going to be traveling for a little while too. So wow, you just keep your, I mean, this is the result of, I would say three years of work to get, to get the brand up to the, this kind of visibility. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen overnight. And I have been an artist for 50 years and I made this radical change of media you know like eight years ago and 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 started working with some professional marketers three years ago and it's this three years of hard work not just on their part my part too that's beginning to get me these things um i've got people in um, england who are very interested in what i do I've been published in um, the Netherlands. It's about this big. That's probably where the Leipzig people it's more than I got. Me, yeah. Best guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And people in Barcelona. And it's all from, and it doesn't amount to much yet, but it's a change. Definitely. You know, and it's, and it's from, it's from building one thing after another thing after another thing and saying yes to the opportunities that present themselves and you can't do them all and you can't wrap your brain around them all, Mm -hmm. but to accept that that is part of the job of making the work. It isn't done until it's been shared. Even if it's just with your kid, I don't care. It's not done until it's been shared. Well, and speaking of sharing, where could people go check out the stuff that you have? Where would you like to send them to? I will send them to SusanHenselProjects.com. That is my main website. And from there, holy buckets, you can get to just about everything. <laughs> um, because I do have SusanHenselGallery.com. Uh-huh. And you can look on artsy.net and search for Susan Hensel Gallery. And you can see the artists I represent. Um, and obviously, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram. I am on Twitter, but I wouldn't call that active. That's more an automatic tweet. It's always a one or the other on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well the one, I wasn't going to do Twitter until a reporter told me that's where they got a lot of their leads. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That is a news. That is a news outlet. 
Huh. Yeah, it is. It's an interesting point. It is. That's how I got a review of one of our gallery shows once. I said, how did you get here? Twitter. Oh, funny. All right. Well, anyway, I want to thank you so much for being on the show today. It was great meeting you. It was great meeting you too, Tom. Mm-hmm.